ask a question about the unfolding of the cosmos. Sure. And <laughs> Don't you love, I mean, where else can you get questions <laughs> like this? This is so cool. Well, just coming from big mind, yeah. it, would, it would seem that it doesn't really matter whether we continue to have a role in this play. In this play? The humans. Sure. And, but on the relative point of view, you know, I think we all care quite a bit about that. Yeah. So next 100 years, next 200 years, what do you think? And why should we care? Ooh. Yeah, good one. Good one. Well, um, it, the reason I'm jamming up a little bit is I'm just finishing a book called The Many Faces of Terrorism about my dating history. <laughs> and I was disturbing to me because a poll of my previous girlfriends rated me slightly above Al-Qaeda on the scary scale. And I was trying to figure out why that was, because I hadn't really blown up any buildings. Um, the Many Faces of Terrorism is, in a sense, about what you just asked, and that's 100, 200 years, and what's unfolding and, and what, it, what could happen and what it means. And I think it's one of the best things I've done. It's turned out to be a very difficult book. Because, and, oh, I don't, uh, you, know, just, you know, you don't want to get a writer started on what they're doing, because not only is it just endless, it's endlessly self-absorbed and boring. And they're going to think, I was like, well, so on chapter three, there was like this whole like thing. Um, <laughs> It's a really good book, though, that does kind of deal with it, with that. But let me let me let me let me answer some of the the, the more sort of um, general points that you raise because I think it's very important. One of the one of the simplest realizations that comes with big mind, big heart, but also one of the ones that's really I think hardest to actually implement is what the traditions, let me give it just a theor dry theoretical explanation first, and then we'll see if we can relate it to your actual experience. Uh, it's what they call absolute and relative truth. And it's also sometimes referred to as um, absolute bodhicitta and relative bodhicitta. And there are all, all sorts of different terms that can be used for it. Um, even nirvana and samsara are essentially similar. So in, in absolute truth, there is, in a sense, that's uh, uh, even the un unmanifest domain. And there's simply nothing wrong there. Uh, should you care about the world from that point of view? No, there is no world arising. Not from the unmanifest point of view. So under those circumstances, nothing bothers you. And that's sort of, I'm just giving one version of the absolute kind of truth. On the, and, and, and there's a whole tradition of just getting absorbed in the nothing bothers me view. And that's the air hat. When you actually get in nervi kalpa and nothing's arising, it's the same as in deep, dreamless sleep at night. Nothing bothers you. Because nothing's arising. Right. So it's easy to get into that state and, and have your question answered. Because it doesn't come up. Yeah. Okay, now there's the other side of the street. Nonetheless, here I am. I understand. Big mind. Gosh, that was swell. But I've got, you know... Uh, and so how do you have big mind, big heart really continue to permeate the individuality that you are? And the great, great uh, um, traditions are always wrestling, both with how to realize that and how to make it really concrete in people's lives. And there's... Um, even, um, in the... Zen tradition, which Big Mind will also go into, or Tozan's ranks, for example, which are really a way of talking about absolute and relative and how do they fit together. And in your own actual feelings, there's this extraordinary balancing between two very apparently contradictory currents. And in my own awareness, they tend to take this form. They take a hundred forms because they never go away. One is that the more 
awakened you become, the more evolved you become, the more you actually feel samsara and the more painful it becomes. And so you really, the pain increases the more you understand that. And also there's a certain, the, the positive emotions are just, the, the happiness gets happier and, and so on. But I want to stick to the painful side of the street. That doesn't go away. You become so sensitive, you can feel everything that's arising for everybody. In this room right now, you can feel 50 or 60 points of awareness and all of the pain and suffering that is inherent in any limited point of view and all of that becomes something that you taste and that you feel constantly and that's on the relative side and then on the absolute side so on the relative side the pain increases it hurts more but on the absolute side it bothers you less and they're both true and getting that paradox together is part of this, the whole way that you wrestle with these things. And so there's a great freedom from all of the suffering that you feel much, much more intensely. And it really, depending, sometimes you can ricochet back and forth between the two. I don't know anybody who has simply resolved that. And I don't think you're supposed to. And I think the people that do are just playing on one side or the other side of that street. And we have to give ourselves plenty of room to both feel absolute perfection in everything that's arising. And yet see one person starving and you will start crying so hard it will kill you. And if you're not doing both, you're doing something wrong. And that's the extraordinary thing about that. So of course you want to work to alleviate suffering. And you want to work to alleviate hunger. But on the absolute side, it's the analogy is if you're in a dream at night and there are thousands of people starving, there are two ways you can stop their hunger. One is in the dream you can try to feed them all. But the second is you can wake up. And that will end their suffering immediately. But they're both right. They're both true. And so playing both of those is what's so extraordinary. And I think that Like you say, I don't know anybody that's really resolved that paradox. And, and I think there are two great archetypes of the awakened soul on this planet. And I think that they both speak to us very strongly. And I don't want to say that one belongs to the East or to the West because you can find them in both. But one is classically <clears throat> thought of as the awakened Buddha who is at peace and has found a way off the wheel of suffering. The other is the Christ figure who recognizes the intersection of the human and the divine and suffers enormously for that realization. And the epitome of the truth of that intersection is the passion, the passion on the cross. I think it's very interesting, it's called the passion because you will passionately be upset at every piece of suffering that arises. It will tear you apart. And the Bodhisattva vow is to engage that suffering without ever turning away. And the, again, it hurts more and bothers you less. There's a great perfection about it all. And they're both true. But I think it's very, very important to honor both sides of the street on that. And so what's going to happen in the next couple hundred years? Read the book. In, in other words, I, mean, it's, it's, I, I think it's going to be very... I can answer that if you want in a minute. I want to sort of touch on these other issues. Um, why should you get involved? Because you made a deep, deep promise at the bottom of your soul to do that. And you really can't turn away. <laughs>